telling you the only thing that matters is that they love Jesus with an absolute passion. Yeah. Um, Joel had said it in 1 John. It talks about that we love because God first loved us. And I just want to read a couple of little quick things of scripture. 1 John 4, uh, verse 10, it says, This is love. He loved us long before we loved him. It was his love, not ours. He proved it by sending his son to be the pleasing sacrificial offering to take away our sins. One of the biggest things I feel like the enemy wants to do is to accuse or to, to cause doubt in our minds whether we're actually loved, whether we actually have any value, whether we actually have any purpose. And something that I've anchored myself in is that if there's ever a moment of doubt, if there's ever a moment of question, I, I just come back to the simple truth of what this verse says here. God already proved his love for you by sending his son. Amen. Jesus already went to that cross and died for you. Amen. And it sounds cliche, like maybe we've heard it before, but the reality is, is that if it was just one of us in this room, he would have said yes. Yeah, yeah. And he said yes before the foundation of the world was even yeah. laid. He said, I see your value, I see your significance, I see your purpose, and I'm saying yes right now yeah. from this moment. And so I just want to encourage you, especially you young ones, never question God's love for you. It's actually really interesting. Something that I've learned over this last year is that if you look throughout the entirety of the Gospels, Jesus only refers to God as God one time. Every other time he refers to God, it's as Father. And so I think one of the chief and primary things that Jesus actually came to do is to fix our broken understanding of who God was. He's not this rule master. He's not a task master. He's not even all the things that the Old Testament alluded to him. They're all truths, but they're partial truths. And Jesus came to set the record straight that God is first and foremost a father. Yeah. And in that, there's a couple of verses that are just like absolutely blessed me as I've come to really understand who he is. John 15, verse 9, it says, this is Jesus speaking right before he's about to go to the cross. And he says, I love each of you with the same love that the father loves me. And so again, like if you're ever in a moment of questioning, like who does God really feel that I am? Even if you're struggling, even if you've been messing up, anchor yourself to verses like this and let them become such a strength to you that Jesus says over your life right now that I love you with the same love that God loved him. Like we wouldn't question, not a single one of us in this room would question the love that God had for Jesus. But we'll oftentimes fall into the trap of questioning that love for ourselves. Um, Ephesians. Verse 5 and 6, 4. It was always his perfect plan to adopt us as his delightful children. Through our union with Jesus, the anointed one said, His tremendous love that cascades over us will glorify His grace. For the same love that He has for His beloved one, Jesus, He has for us. And so in a totally different part of Scripture, a totally different man writing this book, we get the same truth. That God loves each one of us, each one of you in this room. He loves me just as much as He loved His Son, Jesus. And then the last thing that I want to read real quick. like to kind of tie this all together. In the very beginning when God created man, he created Adam and he created Eve and it said that he made them in his image and in his likeness. So we were created in the image of love because First John says that God is love. So we were created in the image of love. And then sin entered into man and he lost his image. And something that the spirit of religion has tried to convince us of is that it was God that changed at the fall. And all of a sudden, maybe it was sin entered man and then God like totally lost his mind and changed. But God has been the same yesterday, today and forever. He never changed. Man changed at the fall. Adam lost his image. And so from that point moving forward, man has been desperately craving this idea of love and, and finding love in things and finding love in other people. And oftentimes ending up completely broken and devastated because of it. Because we never go to the actual source of where our love was always supposed to be found. In Romans 4, David 
David gives us this absolutely incredible truth. And I just, I think I'm just going to end with this. Jesus went to the cross and it says that he was beaten and marred beyond what any man had ever endured. Literally, what it's saying there is that if you looked at him, you would not know who he is. And so in that same sense, Jesus lost his image so that he could win back odds for us. Oh. Something that I've been taught in church and what the spirit of religion loves to teach us. Really, the only message that the religious spirit can ever give you is try harder. I need you to understand that grace says that there's nothing you could ever do. If it's a gift, then there's nothing that we'll ever be able to do to earn it. And I want to go as far as saying, like, we don't even have to sit in a place and say, Jesus, you've done all that. Now I owe you my life. If you owed him something, that would be making the statement that there has to be some sort of payment that wasn't already made. The rest of your life after you say yes to Jesus will simply be out of gratitude for what he's already done. Romans 4, it says, King David himself speaks to us regarding the complete wholeness that comes inside a person when God's powerful declaration of righteousness is heard over our life. Apart from our works, God's work is enough. And here's what David says regarding this. What happy fulfillment is ahead for those whose rebellion has been forgiven and whose sins are covered by blood. I want to say that our sins aren't just covered by blood. They're completely removed. What happy progress comes to them when they hear the Lord speak over them. I'll never hold your sins against you. I just want to say to every person in this room, no matter what we've been taught our entire lives, from the moment that God declared righteousness over you, which is the moment that you said yes to Jesus, your heart, whether you realized it or not, was pierced by the revelation of righteousness. And from that moment, you have been made completely whole. When we hear the word righteousness in church, oftentimes we think that it means that I'm contractually in right standing with God. But what that word righteousness actually means is that you are exactly as you ought to be. God makes no mistakes. And he made you perfectly who you're supposed to be. And from the moment you say yes to Jesus, every past sin, every future sin, all of it is completely obliterated. And I need us to understand that we actually start and finish from the same point. Righteousness. We are as we ought to be. We're not earning it. We're not striving towards it. We're not trying to figure it out. But what David says here is that it's this idea that we are whole. From wholeness comes fulfillment. And from the place of fulfillment, then we actually start to see a little bit of progress. Don't ever let anyone, don't ever let any church, don't ever let any preacher or pastor tell you that you've got to somehow come to a place of gaining enough progress that then someday maybe you'll find a little bit of fulfillment and then maybe one day before you die you'll actually get to a place of wholeness i just want to declare over every person in this room whether it makes sense or not if you've said yes to jesus you're completely whole and you're exactly how he wants you to be and it's from that place that we actually get to walk in a, a way that we can actually become everything that our heart actually wants to be Because it's not a license to sin and get away with it. There's no such thing as sloppy grace. There's only grace. He loves you. With the same love that he had for Jesus. He loves each one of you. And and if that can become real, you'll live the rest of your life so solid. Pastor Sanders said something earlier about clarity. If we see God rightly we really experience him for the fullness of who he is. It's not a religion. It's a relationship with a living God that is as real today as he was when Jesus walked this earth. And he wants to encounter you. And if if you can seek after that, ask Jesus to see him for who he actually is. The rest of your life will be filled with such wonder and such fulfillment beyond anything that you could ever imagine. Chase Jesus. Amen.